Welcome, welcome, welcome. Got people logging on as we speak. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 Pertussis webinar hosted by the Immunisation Coalition. My name's Susie Blackburn. I'm Information and Events with the Coalition. And just for those who are new to the organisation, we're a not-for-profit organisation advocating for immunisation and fighting misinformation, which is a pretty topical subject at the moment. Just a bit of housekeeping before we introduce Angela this evening. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section. Um, you can upvote and we're happy for you to also answer questions if you have some more information for those who have questions in the Q&A. If you have any technical difficulties, please just pop a note in the chat and I'll do what I can to try and resolve any problems you might have. This is a one hour webinar. We will try and ask the questions throughout and then have a question time at the end. Sometimes we don't get to all questions, so you can always email us afterwards. And the other thing is if you are listening in a group, please um, make sure that you email us to stipulate who was in the group for certificates afterwards. You don't need to email us for a certificate. If you're at the webinar for a minimum of 50 minutes, you will actually receive that automatically in the week or two after the event. All right, let's get started. Without further ado, I'd like to, to introduce you to Angela Newbound. Angela has a couple of decades of experience as a nurse educator, immunisation professional, and is a member of the Immunisation Coalition. So welcome, Angela. Thank you very much, Susie. And welcome to everybody that has joined for uh, the webinar tonight. So we're going to be spending uh, an hour together. I hope that uh, we meet our main objective, which is technically that every single one of you might walk away with one new piece of knowledge. And if we accomplish that, we'll be uh, very, very happy with, with that. Like Susie said, um, pop your questions in the chat box and Susie will moderate that and she will uh, interrupt me every so often, just uh, make sure I can get those questions answered. Um, I'm not an encyclopedia, that is for sure. So if there's any questions that come in that uh, I'm not 100% sure about answering, uh, we'll just take them on notice and we'll certainly get back um, to you, given that we have your contact details. So we are here tonight about pertussis, or more commonly known as whooping cough. We know that pertussis uh, is an upper respiratory tract infection, and it is, um, well, Bordetella pertussis is found only in humans. Bordetella pertussis is actually one of 10 known Bordetella species, but the other species are uh, found in animals. We know that this is a really old disease, uh, first described in about the 16th century, to be honest, and uh, organ organism was first isolated in 1906. So we know that pertussis has been one of the most common childhood diseases and one of the major causes of childhood mortality over the years. We know that these pertussis antigens can um, evade our host defences quite well. So we know that when we come into contact with Bordetella pertussis, um, the bacteria will adhere to our um, ciliated epithelia of our trachea and bronchi. And it produces a toxin then, and that toxin disrupts the cell function and seems to be the absolute key for the virulence factor of how sick that we actually do get. So we know that toxin will then cause inflammation of the respiratory tract and that interferes with that ability to clear any pulmonary secretions. And that's why these um, individuals that are infected with pertussis just cough and cough and cough and cough and cough because they're trying to expel those respiratory secretions and they just can't seem to do that. So it's a pretty horrible disease. We also know that it is highly contagious. 
and we know that it can live outside the body reasonably well for a few days and so therefore can survive um, on objects. So making sure once again that uh, we keep our surfaces wiped down and really clean. This particular bacterial infection is really, really common and highly infectious. So about 70 to 80% of susceptible contacts to an infected case will actually become infected themselves. And we know that it will spread through um, settings such as schools. So around about 50 to 80% of susceptible contacts in a school setting, for example, would end up um, becoming ill with pertussis. Clinical diagnosis of pertussis, particularly in infancy, is really, really difficult. The disease will often start like um, cold-like symptoms, maybe a mild cough or a fever. Um, but in little tiny babies, that cough may be really minimal or absolutely absent. Most children under six months of age actually don't really develop that paroxysmal cough and, that, and have that characteristic inspiratory whooping sound that we hear. But they do have recurrent episodes of apnea and cyanosis and bradycardia. And so that is more of the clinical picture that little babies will present with. In school age children though, the majority of them have been vaccinated. We've got really high immunisation uptake in this country. So majority of school kids have been vaccinated. And so therefore the disease is less severe, but they are more likely to display those typical symptoms of pertussis, which includes those coughing spasms and that whooping sound um, on inspiration. Adults um, or older adolescents may present the cough, maybe cold-like symptoms, but usually without that whooping sound as well. And so therefore diagnosis in that um, older adolescent and adult age group is also quite difficult. And, and people will quite often present two or three times to um, a GP, for example, without a diagnosis of pertussis being made. So there are three stages with the um, progression of this particular disease. And that stage one is those really um, typical disease symptoms of coughs or colds or most viral illnesses to be, um, you know, to really be truthful. And so therefore, it's not really surprising that pertussis is actually misdiagnosed. Stage two becomes um, a bit more problematic. And this is where people will definitely start thinking, maybe this person has got whooping cough. And little children will probably start um, turning blue and have that bit of cyanosis when they have those um, dreadful coughing episodes. The coughing spasms, um, really at this stage could be triggered by other things too, such as crying or when the baby's or young child is feeding, if they get a little bit overactive. Um, and tobacco, tobacco smoke has actually been known to be a trigger factor. So uh, another reason why people should not be smoking around little babies. This um, coughing can lead to absolute exhaustion um, and is often called the 100 day cough because it just lasts for weeks and weeks and weeks. And recovery from pertussis can happen really, really slowly. The cough does become less, you know, less frequent and more mild. However, it has been reported that, that those coughing fits can return with other respiratory infections for many months after the pertussis infection. So in regards to complications of pertussis, we do know that these little tiny babies um, are really uh, in a great deal of trouble. 
with this particular disease. We know that um, bacteremia is not a complication of Bordetella pertussis, but we know that bacteremia is a complication of other bacterial infections, particularly those things like pneumococcal disease and meningococcal disease, but not with this particular bacterial infection. So we talked about the fact that um, these bacteria adhere only to those tufts of the ciliated cells in the mucosa of, the, of humans. Um, but there's been no attachment to non-ciliated cells, which is why it can't cause that complication of bacteremia. So you can read there, there's quite a list of horrible complications for infants and as well as adults and adolescents. So Susie, we've got a poll here. We sure do. I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll now. Everyone get your cursors ready. Sure. And where so are the question is, what is the most common cause of death in people with pertussis and particularly babies? We'll give you a few minutes. I'm no Bruce McAvaney, but I'll do a little bit of commentary here. <laughs> Looks like we've got 98% of people going for one particular answer here. Um, about 50% have voted. I'm going to give people another little while if that's okay. Sure. Very interesting. Okay, I'll give you all about five more seconds if you wanted to go ahead and add answers. All right, now I'm not sure if you can, I'll end the poll. Sure. What we've got is 96% of people have chosen B as their answer. Fantastic, and 96% of people are absolutely correct, so B is the answer. Um, Certainly pertussis pneumonia and sometimes complicated with seizures and hypoxic encephalopathy is the main cause of death in people. Okay. Fantastic. Good job. Okay, so burden of disease. Uh, we, we talk about burden of disease quite a lot when we, um, you know, particularly in flu season, we talk about this um, we're certainly talking about it at the moment with, with COVID. What is the burden of disease? So what are the, the rates of notification? And we can see from this that um, there's been rises and falls over the, the courses of the years. Notifications um, by year in 2018, you can just sort of see that there was a uh, not a huge number like there was in 2009, 10, 11, 12, but certainly we were up there with 12,575 notifications across Australia. 2019, uh, it was pretty similar, 12,025 cases across Australia, and you can see that there's only just that tiny, weeny little drop. And um, certainly cases in the zero to four-year-olds and, and the five to nine-year-olds were of greatest concern. We know that pertussis disease is generally uh, seen to be quite a cyclic disease. We have peaks and troughs about every three to four years. And there seems to be a seasonal pattern when they have looked at the months of the year where notifications have been more prevalent and the highest number of notifications usually occur in the late winter or the summer months. So um, between August and February. So we're pretty much in pertussis season if, at the moment, if, uh, if you like. So why do we think there have been um, these rises in some years and then there's been falls in other years and it's certainly about that um, disease being a little bit cyclic perhaps maybe in 2009 2010 when we've got those uh, really high numbers 
we had a heightened awareness around testing because of that lovely little H1N1 swine flu um, pandemic that we had in 2009 and um, providers were, were putting swabs where swabs have never been before, just about um, a little bit like what's happening today in our communities. But, you know, we had a lot more testing, so we were picking up a lot more respiratory infections um, overall. We know that um, control of pertussis is really problematic because immunity, whether it's been through immunisation or infection, um, does wane over time. So this is not um, something that we get lifelong protection from if we've had the disease, not like it's measles or something like that. So we do know that that natural immunity does wane and so does vaccine acquired immunity wane. So we are open to be reinfected um, over courses of time as well. So it's really um, important for people to get their boosters if they haven't had a booster for the last 10 years, and we'll talk about adults and whooping cough a little bit later, um, and certainly making sure that the children are vaccinated, pregnant women are vaccinated, etc. So we'll talk about that a little bit more down the track. So here we're looking at burden of disease um, rates in 2019. And we can see that those um, cases were, you know, not, not too high, but they were certainly high enough. But look at the cases of pertussis disease that were notified in children under the age of 15. So, you know, just over half. But that just show that there's a lot of people aged over 15. So we've got a lot of, um, you know, older adolescents and young adults and, and adult populations that are getting this disease. So these are the people that are traveling and having babies and socializing and uh, studying and have workplace environments. So we really need to be promoting whooping cough boosters to those older populations as well. So if we're looking at uh, cases of pertussis notifications around our country, you can see there's really a wide range of how many cases each particular region does experience each year. And so this is what it looked like last year in 2019. So how are we tracking this year? We have the strangest world on record this year in 2020. So how are we tracking? Um, I looked at some notifications up to the, the 8th of September, so a week or so ago, and ACT, who had 270 cases at this same time last year, you've only had 49 cases. New South Wales, you had 6,333 cases this time last year, and you're down to 1,298 cases. Northern Territory, who had low numbers, 36 last year, have had 14 notifications. Queensland, 1,765 last year, down to 479 at the moment. South Australia, I don't know what's happening here in South Australia, but we haven't changed that much. Um, we had 285 cases last year, but we're sitting at 274 cases recorded so far this year. So uh, not much of an impact happening for us. In Tasmania, 569 cases last year and only 60 so far this year. Victoria, Oh, poor Victoria. You've had it tough, but you're doing well with pertussis. 2,218 cases last year this time and only 1,000 cases to date. Western Australia, 548 cases this time last year and you're down to 111 cases. So if we look at the numbers then Australia-wide, um, there were, at this time last year, 8,760 notifications. And so far this year, we've only got 3,285. So less than half. 
So this social distancing, hand hygiene, staying home if you're well, cough into your elbow, all of those activities that we're doing for COVID, good grief, who would have known that they would work? You know, I think as providers, we've been uh, trying to sing this song for a lot of years to do all of those activities and nobody's really listened to us up until now. And uh, we are now seeing that uh, what we've been saying for years has been the right thing. So, who is most at risk? We know that pertussis, as we could see from those graphs, can affect any age group, but we definitely know that babies and young children um, certainly are at the greatest risk. Um, and the greatest risk of severe disease and the greatest risk of complications and death. Older children, like we said before, may have um, a less serious disease, but that cough can be really, really problematic and uh, certainly um, very, very uncomfortable and lead to having time off work for um, people in the, in the working sector. So in these little tiny infants, like I said earlier, serious disease um, can lead to serious complications, including death, particularly in those little babies that are less than six weeks of age. So before they've had time to have their first vaccine. So protecting the neonate is really, really crucial. So as providers, we must promote the vaccination of pregnant women, and we will go through them shortly. We must promote vaccinating people and babies, particularly on time. We must really try and close that window of opportunity for this baby to contract disease. And we must really promote vaccination of adults if it's been 10 years or more since their last whooping cough booster. We still come across many adults that don't realise that they should be having boosters. They still think that they are protected because they had whooping cough as a baby or they had whooping cough vaccines as a baby or um, as a young child. So who should be vaccinated? Well, we know that this vaccine is on the schedule and we are exceptionally lucky in this country that we have government support for such a robust vaccine program in this country. And it's regardless of which government is in power, which is um, very, very reassuring for us. Um, all governments are committed to high immunisation rates um, in Australia. So we will move on and look at the National Immunisation Program. So remember that first dose at two months can be given as early as six weeks. Really try and talk to parents around timing of vaccination. We know that parents will sometimes do a little bit of creeping. So they'll bring the baby in a little bit early and it might be a couple of days or it might be a week. And then it tends to get through the community that, oh, well, they vaccinated my baby when I took my baby in and it was a week early. So this next baby comes in at 10 days early. Oh, well, I think I should be able to get it vaccinated now. So you just get this creeping and then all of a sudden these children are receiving vaccines potentially that will not be accepted as valid um, by the AIR, the Australian Immunisation Register. So it's so important to really talk to parents about staying on schedule. So we look at attaining the age of the schedule. So once the baby has attained six weeks, bring them in for their vaccines. Once they've attained four months, bring them in for their vaccines. So keeping them on schedule, not early, not late, just on schedule. Remember when you're planning your catch-up vaccinations that you're using DTP as in capital D, capital T, capital P with the little A, um, such as 
Infanrix or triple cell um, type vaccines, quadricell vaccines in children less than 10 years of age. But once a child has had their 10th birthday, we need to shift and use the DTPA vaccines such as little d, big T, little p with the little a, um, such as your Boostrix and Adacel vaccines. So any person that's had their 10th birthday onwards, you would be using those vaccines. Remember too, if a child misses that fourth dose of um, DTPA, so that's due at 18 months, so perhaps they may be, um, maybe let's say three and a half years of age or maybe three years and eight months um, and they've missed their 18 month old and they haven't had that fourth dose of DTP, you can certainly give it to them if they're older than three years and six months. And it can be counted as their uh, four year old dose and they will not need the fifth dose. So in effect, you would be giving them a DTP IPV, so an Infanrix IPV or a Quadracel at that time. But they must have attained three years and six months for that rule. Remember when you're catching children up over 10 years of age and we've moved to Boostrix or Adacel vaccines, they are what is funded under the NIP. And if the individual also needs to be caught on polio, then IPOL as a separate vaccine is what is funded under the NIP. Now, Angela, we've just got a comment in the chat from Nadine. She's just asking if, if we're finding that the efficacy is waning after four or so years, why are we recommending a 10 year booster? Oh, look, you know, this is the big golden question really, isn't it? I think they're waiting really for more evidence um, to know what level of boosting of antibodies there is if we right. give boost to doses. Sure. Um, this, is, this is a conversation that's happening around the world. This is not just an issue for Australia. This is a worldwide issue. And there are great discussions that are happening to whether or not that interval should be shortened. Um, you know, we talk about recommendations and the recommendation is 10 years. However, we know that this is a really well tolerated vaccine because we're giving it to our pregnant women with every pregnancy, regardless of interval between pregnancies. So they may be getting a DTP every year for three or four years if they're pregnant, um, you know, three or four times in that time. So we know that it's well tolerated, but they're just, you know, everything that we do is about risk and benefit and everything that we do is evidence-based. So I think it's a bit of a watch, wait and see, and it certainly wouldn't be a surprise if they did lower it. There are some, organisations um, such as maternity hospitals that are recommending that their staff have a booster if it's been five years since their last um, pertussis containing vaccine. That's an organisational um, decision they can make. Okay, great. Thanks for the question and comment too, Nadine. Thank you very much. So who should be vaccinated? I think we're well and truly covering this point um, ad nauseum. Um, but definitely adults, any person that wishes pr to protect themselves from pertussis. So, you know, we will talk a little bit um, about pregnancy in the next slide, but let's talk about people that are around pregnant women. So we, we're talking about the partners, we're talking about the grandparents. And I think it's probably now time to change our conversation that we have at the moment, a lot of providers are suggesting and recommending these vaccines for adults who are going to be around little babies because you know it'll stop you getting whooping cough and passing it on to the little baby. And it's and it's we're still in that little mindset, I think, around um, cocooning strategies, which we'll talk about later. But I think 
um, nobody wants to get this disease. No one, no adult will want to get this disease. So this is about protecting them. And yes, it does cocoon the baby a little bit, but the best antibodies we can give babies are, is from the mum. So definitely talk to adults. They do not want to get sick with whooping cough. So our pregnant women, um, there was a change in those recommendations um, to bring this vaccine forward to the optimal time of between 20 and 32 weeks gestation. However, the vaccine can be given up until delivery. Obviously, we would really like mums to receive this vaccine at least two weeks before they deliver the baby because that gives the antibodies enough time to build and to transfer across to the baby to give the baby the optimal protection. So if we were to vaccinate a mum today at, at 40 weeks and she goes into labour tomorrow and delivers her baby, unfortunately those antibodies haven't had enough time really to confer protection to that little baby. And you would certainly need to be um, advising the mum of that. So as soon as these, these women present around that 20 week um, time frame of pregnancy, please offer this vaccine early, um, earlier in the pregnancy than later. So this is an interesting question. This is another poll. And so when are maternal antibodies likely to be transported to the fetus? The poll is up and live. Thank you. Looks like it's between two answers at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of skipping about actually. We've got a little bit of interest in all answers. So this might be a good discussion. We've got about 50% have voted. Very good. And five more seconds to pop your answer in there. Three, two, people are still putting them in. I feel like I should just <laughs> let them go. Um, all right, I think we've slowed now. So end poll and I will launch it because it's an interesting, I'll hey, share the results. A, so yeah, we've got about 47% saying B, 20 plus. But there's an even spread between them. I say, it is a bit of a spread around. The actual answer is C. We actually, there is actually really good evidence to say that the transfer of pertussis antibodies to the infant in um, women who receive DTP vaccine as early as 13 weeks gestation. Um, you know, these antibodies are transferring across the placenta that, that early. So if, for example, a woman um, has the vaccine a little earlier than 20 weeks, but, but after 13 weeks, you do not need to revaccinate them. So the evidence is there that pertussis antibodies do transfer across to the baby as, as early as 13 weeks. So, very good. Okay. Is it worth just asking you, uh, Louise, is a lovely question there. Would baby get some protection from breast milk is her question. Okay. So breast milk, a wonderful thing for babies. Um, there's no denying that. Um, they do get some antibodies, but what we do know of breast milk is that those antibodies are not um, high enough to be of protective level. So breast milk alone won't protect the baby from contracting the disease and getting really sick but it will certainly help their immune systems for sure. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and we've got another one. If the maximum transfer occurs at 30 weeks, why was the recommendation brought back to 20? So, 13, so um, the, the recommendation was brought back to 20 weeks um, rather than 28 weeks because we have a lot of little babies being born preterm. They are born at 26 weeks, they're born at 28 weeks. We know that at 20 weeks, the fetus may be considered to be viable for life. And so if we can take from 20 weeks, by the time the antibody transfer occurs, say at 22 weeks, and if that mum was then to go ahead and deliver a baby at 22 or 23 weeks, uh, it's slim, but there is a possibility of viability. Um, certainly babies born at 24 weeks um, have um, you know, significantly, significantly improved outcomes, um, long road, long journey, but um, you know, they, they potentially could survive that. So by bringing that vaccine forward to 20 weeks um, gives ample opportunity to um, have for pregnant mums to get this vaccine before they deliver. So if we can vaccinate early, that's much better than vaccinating later. Great, thank you. So in regards to these women who, for whatever reason, do not receive their DTP during pregnancy. So this could be those exact mums that are coming in and delivering at 24 or 25 weeks gestation, but have not yet got around to having their um, DTP booster, then we would certainly be wanting to vaccinate that mum um, post-delivery as soon as we can. Now, it is a protection of the baby because what we're actually really trying to do is to minimise that risk of the mother contracting pertussis and then with, cl with the close contact that she's going to have with the baby, um, transmitting it to the baby. So unfortunately, vaccinating the mum post-delivery is not going to protect the baby as well, but it will afford some indirect um, protection. Better than nothing at all, for sure. So we talked about um, other contacts with little tiny babies. So um, partners, grandparents, babysitters, aunties, uncles, etc. And these are a really important group because there's been quite a lot of research done into who has been the source of infection in young babies. And in more than 50% of the cases, it is um, parents. And definitely older siblings have played a role in this as well. So we looked at those stats of how many Pertussis notifications there were in individuals over 15 years of age um, a few slides ago. So you can definitely see there's a substantial amount of disease in the community in that, age, in that older age group. And we certainly, um, yes, we want to protect the individual as well as the infant. So adults working with young children most definitely uh, are recommended this booster every 10 years, same as healthcare workers. Um, as we've discussed, you know, let's, let's hope at some stage that that may, may well be revised. Big um, discussions around the world, there's no, no doubt about that. You know, we're certainly seeing a big movement to in um, maternity hospitals and mums groups, etc., about no vax, no visit type requests of parents with newborns. And it's really become quite widespread. You can download these little uh, cards to send out to family and friends. Um, so people are becoming a lot more conscious of 
their little baby um, and the risk that they might have of contracting pertussis from an older adult or an older sibling. So if we look at the vaccine formulations, and this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier, see how we've got a capital D, capital T, capital P. These are the formulations for children less than 10 years of age. And we have quite a few of them listed here that are available in Australia. So it is so important as a provider that we check our vaccine three times before we give it because these are so easy to get mixed up. Are you giving an Infanrix? Are you giving Infanrix Hexa? Are you giving an Infanrix IPV? We've got to make sure that we've got the right vaccine for the right age group of child. So that first vaccine check should be at the fridge when you reach in and get the vaccine out. The second vaccine check, it's a good idea to, to check that with the parent and just let them know, okay, so babies at this age, they're due this, and this is the vaccine that we're going to be giving. And therefore the parent um, is also aware that their child um, is actually receiving the vaccine. And that's another check for you. Once you've got all your vaccines out of their packaging, et cetera, and you're about to uncap that needle, just take one more glance at the syringe that you have in your hand, making sure once again that you have got the correct vaccine. So we've got our third poll, Susie. Yes, and here we go. Poll number three, final poll of the evening. So this is in regards to Infanrix Hexa, which must be reconstituted by adding those entire contents of the syringe, because those contents contain five antigens. And then needs to be reconstituted with the Hib pellet that's in the vial. So once it's completely dissolved, how soon um, should we be using, or if it's reconstituted, how long can it be stored for? Very good. So we've got 25% voted so far. Fifty percent. Hmm. One particular answer there has about 70% of people thinking that's the one. So we'll give them one more chance and ending the poll. Here you go, Angela. Here's the well, results. People did pretty good. Mm. Um, however, the answer is actually D. It can may be stored at room temperature for not more than eight hours. It's not going to hurt if you put it back in the fridge, but it actually can may be stored at room temperature for not more than eight hours. Excellent. Thank you for that. Here we have those um, little D, big T, little P, a formulations. So these particular vaccines have the lesser diphtheria and pertussis antigens, but the same amount as the tetanus antigen as what's in the childhood vaccines, which is why the T is still a capital T. So these sorts of DTP vaccines are used in adolescents and adults, and these are generally the ones that, um, that are available. Just be reminded that Boostrix and Adacel, like I said a little bit earlier, are the funded vaccines if we are using them for catch-up programs of people over 10 years of age. Um, however, if somebody uh, is wanting a private script, they're about to travel somewhere and they want a polio booster as well, then they could potentially source um, Boosterix IPV or something like that. So, um, but the NIP 
um, pregnant women is Boostrix or Adacel, as well as the school immunisation program, as well as um, the refugee and other humanitarian entrant program, um, vaccine programs, catch up programs as well. So we talk about vaccine efficacy, and this is where we do know that uh, we do have a decline, um, a bit of waning over time. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things where we sort of say, you know, 60 or 70% of an airbag is, you know, car crash is better than no airbag at all. So whilst we know that vaccine immunity wanes, we still know that some people, um, you know, people will still get some protection from disease or from serious disease, most definitely. So it's a three dose primary series. Um, and in children, we give that at six weeks or two months, four months and six months. And it has reasonably good um, protective efficacy against severe disease at 84%. We know um, that by the time a child is getting towards four years of age, that those primary doses at two, four, six months have started to wane, which is why they bought in the 18 month old booster. For those immunisation providers that have been immunising for a really long time, we used to have an 18 month old DTP booster on our schedule. And that was removed from the schedule in around 2003 because of injection site reactions. And there was some evidence there that uh, perhaps we weren't really giving them um, any further benefit from giving that booster. However, over time and with more research, we uh, certainly are more aware of the waning of this particular vaccine um, protection and therefore really do need to be boosting these children before they get to four years of age. So hence the booster dose came back onto the schedule and is given at 18 months of age. So, we, like I said, still know that having the vaccine, even though it is going to wane, there is benefit to having the vaccine and there is evidence that there is protection there. But we also know that people can still contract the disease, but they just don't get severe disease. And we've seen this a lot in healthcare workers who had their booster vaccine two, two and a half years ago, but they've actually contracted pertussis, but they're not that sick. But we still don't want them infecting others, so, and particularly little babies that they might be looking after. Angela, just a, a, a note from Bronwyn. Um, yes. Just regarding the recommendation to encourage the first do dose at eight weeks rather than six weeks, um, is there a possible blunting effect? from maternal antibodies by chance. Paediatricians apparently are sending babies at six weeks. Best advice for parents? Yes, look, we, we would say send the baby in at six weeks. Um, we, we would definitely be recommending vaccinating at six weeks rather than eight weeks. Um, getting that baby to have its own antibodies being built before the maternal antibodies wane um, is absolutely ideal. So, Definitely bring bubbies in at six weeks of age and give them that first dose so they can start building their own antibodies. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. So with our pregnant women vaccine program, this has been hugely successful and it is really, really important that we do offer this vaccine to all pregnant women. And I would really strongly suggest that if you have the opportunity to have conversations with women as soon as they technically find out they're pregnant, that this is on the cards for them to have when they are at 20 weeks. As soon as they've turned 20 weeks, 
This is the vaccine that's going to be offered to them. You will already be talking about flu vaccine, particularly if it's flu vaccine um, time of year, but definitely have that conversation start it then, rather than waiting until they come in at 20 weeks and then all of a sudden you're pushing a whole heap of information on them and they've got to make a snap decision and it's all a little bit too overwhelming with them. Because this um, vaccine in pregnant women, those maternal antibodies are the most effective way of protecting newborns um, because these maternal antibodies transfer so well um, across the placenta. I mentioned this cocooning effect um, a little bit earlier. And while there is some merit to cocooning and making sure that everybody that's around the baby is vaccinated, it really will only be effective if the baby does not move out of the cocoon. I have seen babies in the supermarket that are less than seven days old. So that baby is definitely out of the cocoon. So vaccinating mums and dads, you know, vaccinating dads or partners, grandparents, babysitters, aunties and uncles, it, it is great. But as soon as the baby ends up in a shopping center, it's out of the cocoon. So the cocoon is of no benefit to it at all, um, if that's the case. So most definitely we, we want people to be protected from disease is, absolutely the priority. So talk to the grandparents, certainly talk to the partners of the pregnant woman. Um, and it's about them getting the vaccine to protect themselves more so than um, protecting the baby now, if mum has been vaccinated in pregnancy for sure. So vaccine safety is always um, on the tip of our tongue, it's something that we need to deal with all the time. We have more and more questions from parents around the safety of particular vaccines. Those of you that have been vaccinating for a long time may well remember the DTPW. So this was a whole cell pertussis vaccine, whereas now we've got the little DTPA, so A meaning acellular vaccine. But certainly the old triple antigen, as it used to be called, diphtheria, tetanus and whole cell pertussis, um, certainly had um, much higher reactions um, in fever um, and localised reactions than what the acellular pertussis vaccines that We really don't see high fevers really with acellular pertussis vaccines. Um, we can see significant local reactions, um, such as this extensive limb swelling that can um, eventuate after booster doses. And this is the type of reaction that we were seeing um, before that 18 month old pertussis vaccine uh, was stopped back in 2003. So these extensive limb swelling reactions. So, we can tolerate a reasonable amount of limb swelling, but if the redness and swelling involves the joint above or the joint below the injection site, then it is a reportable adverse event. It's just a red and swollen deltoid. Um, you know, even if it's sort of the size of um, you know, a, a ping pong ball or, you know, a, a, a mandarin, it's, it's not a reportable adverse event. So vaccinating in pregnancy, you might have a lot of pregnant women who are um, quite concerned about having a vaccine in pregnancy. Um, they are quite often very concerned about taking anything, even a Panadol tablet in pregnancy. So they would be probably questioning you, is this safe? And there's certainly no increased risk of 
um, poor pregnancy outcomes with this particular vaccine. Very, very well tolerated and the benefits far, far, far outweigh any risks because the risks are really, really tiny, if, if at all. So contraindications for the vaccine. We know that there are only two true contraindications to vaccines. One is that they've had an anaphylactic reaction previously to the vaccine, or that they've had an anaphylactic reaction to a component that is in the vaccine previously. Otherwise, people should be vaccinated. We may need to, from time to time, defer vaccine. Um, and that might be in the case that the person that is presenting um, has a fever of 38.5 degrees or higher on the day of vaccination. We would definitely be recommending that we didn't vaccinate that day. We just would like to see that fever go away first and then bring them in. So just pop a little reminder on to recall the patient in about three days because the child should really be um, afebrile by then. So treatment with um, antibiotics, of course, being a bacterial infection, we can use antibiotics. Um, certainly there are certain antibiotics that are preferred above others. We definitely know that, um, you know, we need to be a little bit careful which antibiotics we use in particular age groups of individuals, but generally uh, um, azithromycin or clarithromycin are the, um, pick of the bunch really in regards to what antibiotics to use. Antibiotics are really only going to be um, of any benefit if they are given very, very early in the disease process. So remember earlier I said that it's sometimes two visits or so to a GP before pertussis is actually considered or diagnosed. And usually by then, the individual has been unwell or coughing for around three weeks. If they have been coughing for three weeks, um, they have got past their infectious stage, so we wouldn't be giving antibiotic, uh, antibiotics to them. They've already infected everybody that they're going to infect by that stage. So definitely antibiotics need to be started early in the disease process. So if you have a clinical suspicion that this person has pertussis, uh, you're better off doing a swab and sending that off um, for nucleic acid testing and getting a result, and, and, but meanwhile starting them on antibiotics. So definitely, these are the people that you would definitely be wanting to talk antibiotic therapy with, um, particularly for women in the last month of pregnancy, and um, making sure that we, we get on, on board Definitely look at um, the guidelines around management of pertussis cases and pertussis contacts, particularly in regards to not only antibiotic use, but certainly whether there needs to be exclusions from work or from school or from childcare. So our very last slide, just to conclude, I think we've um, definitely established that pertussis um, is a very contagious and serious respiratory infection. It's caused by Bordetella pertussis, which is a bacteria. We know that that major symptom is that characteristic cough um, and that whooping sound, but only whooping sound in certain age groups that our little babies less than six months are at um, greatest risk of severe illness and death. And we know that there is free vaccine available on the NIP for different individuals. One of the things that qualifies people to receive NIP vaccines is that they have a Medicare card or 
they are a refugee or humanitarian visa entrant. We know that we, uh, to reduce pertussis in infants, that we need lots of people around the baby to be vaccinated as well as the pregnant mum, absolutely most important. And we know that that timing of optimal vaccination in pregnant women is 20 to 32 weeks, but we can vaccinate later than 20, uh, 32 weeks, sorry. Uh, we can vaccinate later than 32 weeks if, uh, if we need to, but hopefully two weeks before the baby is actually born so the baby can get protection from those maternal antibodies. So, great for me. Thank you. I've popped my video up so we can have a quick chat about a couple of the questions that have just come in towards the end there. Sure. Now, there's two in particular about the storage. Uh, both, it looks like, are referring to the infant Rix Hexa. Um, Ping has asked how long can it be stored in the fridge for after reconstitution? Uh, the eight hours. The eight hours. Yes. Good. Lisa has just wanted um, clarification. If it's not reconstituted, is it the same? If you haven't recon, no, um, it's only when it's reconstituted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Great. Thank you. What are the recommendations for booster doses over fifty-five years? Is there an age or no? No. Sorry. Give. 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 Yeah. Give. And if give. there's been ten years. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. It, it, there's no upper age limit really for the for these vaccines. So if any adult, it's been ten years or more please talk to them about having a booster. Fantastic. And it looks like that's it for now. I am looking at the time and we've just after seven o'clock. So once again, on behalf of the Immunisation Coalition, Angela, thank you so much for your time, effort. You really do um, present these sessions well. And there's a few people commenting that they've not learnt one thing, but many things. Oh, tonight. fantastic. So well done. <laughs> All right. Okay. We'll say good night to everyone, but please remember that um, if you have any further questions, you can email us at Immunisation Coalition. Uh, a recording of the webinar will actually go up onto our website in the coming week or so. And please make sure you've subscribed because our virtual events calendar is growing daily and uh, we're having lots and lots of really great webinars coming up, including COVID. We've got herpes zoster coming up. Um, so please subscribe so you get all those alerts and um, find out about those events all right thanks thank again Angela are you anything else you want to say no I'd just like to thank everybody for joining the webinar and thank you Susie for your great work no and worries. The Foundation Coalition for inviting me to present the webinar fantastic pleasure thank you. thank you so much there's a small survey for you to complete your feedback is more than welcome and we wish you all good night and good health bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>